Good morning. I'm Kenneth Moe. And I'm Monica Sar Abdi. Here are the top five things to know this Tuesday. Number one, rising tensions with Iran. Iran's supreme leader says there will be no talks with the U.S., ending speculation about a possible meeting this month. His announcement came one day after President Trump played down talk of possible military action. In response to the massive attack on Saudi Arabia's oil facilities, U.S. officials have pointed the finger at Iran for that attack. Number two, a police officer in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, has been fatally shot. It happened as he was trying to track down a suspect wanted for robbery and assault. Investigators say the officer followed the suspect into a house where they exchanged gunfire. That suspect is now in custody. The 40-year-old officer leaves behind two daughters and a fiancé. He's the fourth officer in Alabama killed in the line of duty this year alone. On to number three, another death is being blamed on e-cigarettes and vaping. This time in Central California, it's the seventh death nationwide. The news came just hours after the state of California announced it will crack down on counterfeit vaping supplies and devices. Meanwhile, at the federal level, the CDC has now activated its emergency operations center to coordinate its response to the rising number of vaping-related illnesses and deaths. Number four. Saturday Night Live has fired a new cast member before he even makes his debut on the show, is reigniting the debate over what's comedy and what's offensive. Shane Gillis was fired after video of him surfaced mimicking a Chinese accent and using a racist slur to refer to Asian people, including a joke about presidential candidate Andrew Yang. Yang has come to his defense, saying Gillis should not lose his job. The two are now planning to meet. And finally, number five, Alex Trebek is speaking exclusively with ABC News about his battle with pancreatic cancer. Talking one-on-one -on -one with our TJ Holmes, the 79-year-old revealed what he told his co-workers when he got back to work hosting Jeopardy. I enjoy what's going on now. Uh, I realize that there is an end in sight for me, just as there is for everyone else. Uh, one line that I have used with our staff in recent weeks and months is that when I do pass on, one thing they will not say at my funeral is, oh, he was taken from us too soon. <laughs> hey, guys, I'm 79 years old. I've had one hell of a good life. As long as I can walk out and greet the audience and the contestants and run the game, I'm happy. He also revealed a recent setback. He says he's currently undergoing a second round of chemotherapy and has struggled to regain his strength. Well, we are all praying for Alex Trebek this morning. Let's get right to that breaking news. Iran's supreme leader is speaking out after the recent attack on Saudi Arabia's oil industry. He's vowing to cut off all communication with the U.S. It comes as U.S. officials point the finger at Iran for the attack on the Saudi oil field. ABC News has learned about a potentially crucial piece of evidence that has been found. ABC's Trevor Alt has all the new details. Trevor, good morning. Good morning, Mona. Good morning, Kenneth. Yeah, the tension in the Gulf is still extremely high. We know Iranian officials have said that they are prepared for full-fledged war. But on the U.S. side, the reaction does seem to be settling a little bit, or at least being a little bit more nuanced. We know that immediately this weekend, President Trump had said the United States was locked and loaded. Now he's sort of appearing to be willing to take his time. He says there's no rush to respond as they continue to gather more information about this attack on a Saudi oil facility. And yesterday he was asked what is his message to Iran. Take a listen to what he had to say. I think uh, I'll have a stronger message or maybe no message at all uh, when we get the final results of what we're looking at. But right now, it's too soon to say. I don't want war with anybody. I'm somebody that would like not to have war. So several American officials, including Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, after this attack happened, immediately said Iran was responsible. President Trump has been a bit more cautious in his wording. He says it looks like it was Iran, but the evidence isn't yet definitive, and he's kind of waiting to see as that investigation unfolds. And something that could help in that investigation is something that a source in the U.S. government has told us. We know that 20 drones and nearly a dozen cruise missiles were fired in this attack. A senior U.S. official tells us one of those drones and one of those cruise missiles have been recovered mostly intact. So that should help in the process of maybe verifying who exactly is responsible in this attack. We know that Iran from the beginning has said they didn't have anything to do with it. They are staying uh, steady in that response, saying that it wasn't them, even though many U.S. officials believe that it was. And even so, 
The possibility of maybe diplomatic talks between these two countries is not looking very good. We know that in the past, President Trump, many other U.S. officials had said he'd be willing to meet with Iran with no preconditions. The president now says that is not true. And then also you touched on that breaking news, the Ayatollah now saying that there will be no talks with the U.S. between Iran and the U.S. at any level. Guys. And Trevor, this situation is expected to have an impact here in the United States, and we may even see a spike in gas prices. Yeah, then that's possibly happening very soon within the coming weeks. Analysts are expecting a gas price spike of as much as a quarter per gallon, which really does add up. And especially the problem could be happening in California. That state really relies more on the oil supply that comes from Saudi Arabia. With half of Saudi Arabia's oil out of commission, that's really going to be a significant hit. But President Trump is sort of downplaying the the problem. He spoke at a campaign rally in New Mexico. He accused the Obama administration of a war on American energy that he has since ended. He says, we have a lot of oil, we have a lot of gas. A couple years ago, he says they'd be panicking, but he is very calm and says that Americans don't have anything to worry about. All right, Trevor All, thank you for the breakdown from Washington. We appreciate it. And the president made a surprising claim Monday while discussing how prepared the U.S. military is to take on Iran or any other country. He says shortly after taking office, then Defense Secretary Jim Mattis told him the U.S. is very low on ammunition and asked him to hold off on a potential military strike. It's not clear what the president was referring to, but there were reports last year that the U.S. was running out of bombs. Mattis has declined to comment. And New York City prosecutors have subpoenaed President Trump's accounting firm seeking eight years of his personal and business tax returns. The district attorney's office had previously subpoenaed the Trump Organization for records related to hush money payments for porn star Stormy Daniels, apparently arranged to silence her about an alleged affair with the president. Democratic presidential hopeful Elizabeth Warren drew a massive crowd here in New York, the biggest of her campaign so far. She took, she took direct aim at President Trump, calling him corruption in the flesh. Our campaign reporter Sasha Pezenik talked to Warren supporters about why they came out. Kenneth and Mona, I'm here in the massive selfie line outside of Elizabeth Warren's event. She just wrapped up a little while ago and voters are here standing in line maybe for hours waiting to take a selfie with her. You'll see here it goes all the way back here through the park, sweeping all the way back, winding through the paths. Estimated here like around 20,000 people. Uh, it's one of the largest campaign events yet this cycle. We spoke to some of the people here in these massive crowds tonight, and they said that what really resonates with them is she's fighting for the little guy with her plans to fight corruption in Washington and throughout the country. I live in New York City. It's getting harder and harder to live here. The rent keeps going up. Salaries don't go up. It, it's sickening to me that the smallest amount of people have more wealth than the majority of the people, and it's time to change that. She's a fighter, and she always says that, I'm here to fight. She's she is unflappable. <laughs> she doesn't seem to ever be at a loss for some very, very well chosen words. What's interesting is that the Working Families Party, a key progressive group here, agrees. They endorsed her the same day that she had her massive rally here in Washington Square Park. The thing is, in 2016, they endorsed Bernie Sanders, uh, tonight endorsing Elizabeth Warren, and uh, she's out here making her pitch for 2020. Kenneth and Mona. A big night for Elizabeth Warren, who has been surging in the polls, but she still has a ways to go to catch up to Bernie Sanders and frontrunner former Vice President Joe Biden. Moving on, the United Auto Workers and General Motors are in nonstop talks, but a source says they are nowhere near reaching a deal for a new contract. Nearly 50,000 UAW workers are on the picket lines at GM facilities in nine states. A main sticking point seems to be the union's demand that GM bring some jobs that were moved to Mexico back to the U.S. Officials say talks are going nonstop until a deal is reached. Another U.S. service member has died in Afghanistan. NATO says the American was killed in action, but isn't providing any other details. It's the 17th U.S. combat death there this year. There have also been three non-combat deaths. In the nearly 18-year war, 2,400 Americans have died in Afghanistan. And now to disturbing results from a new nationwide study revealing that more than 3 million women say their first sexual encounter was rape. That's one in 16 women between the ages of 18 and 44 who were either forced or coerced into having sex for the first time. 
The average age of the victims was just 15 years old compared to 27 for the assailants. Researchers believe the actual figures would be much larger if the study was done after the Me Too movement and if women of all ages were included. Well, former Boston Red Sox star David Ortiz is opening up about the shooting that nearly killed him. Big Poppy met with reporters in Boston yesterday. Ortiz says when he was shot, he thought he was in the middle of a nightmare. As doctors tried to save him, he had one concern on his mind. I remember telling the doctor before, I, before they put me to sleep, it was, don't let me die. You know, I got kids that I want to be with them. You know, that's all I worry about, my kids. Ortiz says he's not afraid to go back to his native Dominican Republic. However, he says he plans to be more careful. He also said he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Well, the polls are now open in Israel for one of the most important elections, and it's more than 70 years of existence. Benjamin Netanyahu is already the longest-serving prime minister, but he's also the only party leader who couldn't form a government after winning an election. ABC's Brad Milkey has more. Brad? Hey, yeah, there is so much tension in the Middle East right now, and today, Israel could see its biggest political shakeup in a decade. Israelis are heading to the polls today, deciding whether to re-elect Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. And if this sounds familiar, it's because we did this back in April. Netanyahu won, but other parties refused to work with him, so today, we've got a redo. Now, think about it. To win that race, Netanyahu had to overcome this huge corruption scandal. Prosecutors were calling for his indictment. So I asked ABC's Jordana Miller in Jerusalem, how could he lose this today? Essentially, there's been a rebellion in the right-wing bloc that has kept Netanyahu in power for 10 years. And suddenly, one of those big players has said, I'm finished. I'm done. I'm going to try to actually uh, bring you down and, you know, grab and steal some of those right-wing votes. And so Netanyahu is in the toughest place he has been in his long political career. He has a fractured base and he has a formidable rival in the center. So he is up against a wall. And Jordana says that is why you've seen more promises from Netanyahu in the last few weeks, to annex new lands, to build Israeli settlements on disputed lands. But Jordana says whoever wins today, expect both men to be hawks on Iran. We will preview this very important election on Start Here later this morning. Listen on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcasting app. Kenneth, Mona? Looking forward to it, Brad. Thank you. A young boy near Pensacola, Florida, gave his family the fright of their lives when he disappeared Sunday. Three-year-old Adric Hughes has autism and doesn't speak very much. His mother says he wandered away from their home into a wooded area. When Adric couldn't, been, couldn't be found, police decided to bring in bloodhounds to help search. The dogs were able to quickly locate the boy. As soon as they hit the ground 28 minutes later, mom was reunited with her son. So, great day great day. They're the best words I've ever heard in my life. We found the kid. Adric suffered a few scratches and bug bites during the more than two hours that he was missing. Police then presented him with a big stuffed dog at a news conference yesterday. That dog that located Adric was also there. Pretty nice. Mm -hmm. Well, coming up Saturday Night Live fires one of his new comedians before he made his debut on the show. Find out who's coming to his defense over racist jokes he made in the past. But first, the British Prime Minister booed in Luxembourg. His move to suspend Parliament over Brexit in court this morning. We'll go across the pond for more after this. Welcome back. We turn now to a neighborhood in Maine being compared to a war zone after a massive explosion killed a firefighter. Investigators will be back at the scene in Farmington today as we learn about a recent construction at that building. Overnight, a community coming together in Maine. Remembering a fire captain killed in this massive building explosion. We decided to come today because we feel it's important, even though we didn't know the firefighter personally, to support the town and um, show that we care for our first responders. New drone video this morning shows the debris littering the ground after the blast leveled the building. It was just total devastation. Been in the law enforcement 35 years. I've never seen anything like this before in my life, except overseas. It was horrible. The fire department responded to reports of a gas smell at the office building, which was newly renovated and open only for two weeks. While they were investigating the gas smell, the building exploded.
It just looked like a snowstorm, all this insulation that was coming up and coming in the air. I heard like a bang and my windows and the back glass door was shaking. The blast killed 68-year-old fire captain Michael Bell, a 30-year veteran of the department. His colleagues paused to pay respects as his body was removed from the scene. And later, they lined up outside the medical examiner's office for a procession to the funeral home. We all know the uh, fireman that was uh, killed today, and it affects us tremendously. Seven other people were injured, including four firefighters sent to the intensive care unit and a maintenance worker who's being praised for reporting the gas odor early enough to evacuate everyone. So now to the United Kingdom, where all eyes are on the Supreme Court there, considering whether Prime Minister Boris Johnson's decision to suspend Parliament for five weeks to push through his Brexit plan was lawful. So let's go across the pond to Julia McFarlane, who is there at the Supreme Court in London for more. Julia, good morning. Morning, Kenneth. Morning, Mona. Uh, yeah, as you can see, quite a, a busy scene outside the Supreme Court. We're just around the corner from the Houses of Parliament, uh, and there's a lot of press, all the world's media here. There's loads of protesters uh, just out of sight, and that's because uh, the Supreme Court uh, is just hearing uh, two appeals with regards uh, to Brexit, as you say. Um, now, Boris Johnson is possibly in a bit of hot water because last week um, a high, uh, the uh, Supreme Court version in uh, Scotland uh, ruled that his suspension of Parliament was unlawful and that he misled the Queen, uh, members of the Upper House uh, of Parliament here in the UK. They argued that Boris Johnson actually wanted to suspend Parliament, not for the reasons he gave uh, in order to bring forth new legislation, but to uh, bypass uh, parliamentary scrutiny because this is all about that Halloween Brexit deadline that is fast approaching. Now, um, this, I just have to tell you guys, uh, 11 out of the 12 Supreme Court justices have been uh, recalled back to hear this case. We are outside legal uh, term time, as it were. So that, that just shows uh, how important this is, how the arguments are likely to be very, very finely balanced. We're going to expect um, decisions in the next uh, couple of days. And Julia, we talked yesterday about the prime minister referring to himself as the incredible Hulk. Uh, others criticizing him as the incredible sulk, but he also got booed in Luxembourg. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, Mona, I'm not sure if you can see. Uh, he's gone away now, but there was a man uh, just sort of wandering around just where we're standing right now. He's dressed as the Incredible Hulk, wearing a blonde wig. Uh, uh, we think uh, probably had a dig to Boris Johnson. What happened yesterday was Prime Minister Boris Johnson. He is now on a crash course of trying to talk to European leaders. He was in Luxembourg uh, yesterday. Um, and he basically cancelled, well, well, Boris Johnson cancelled um, a joint press conference uh, with the uh, uh, Luxembourg Prime Minister because he was surrounded by protesters. Now, number 10 have said it would have been chaos if it had gone ahead uh, outside in that location that they, he was due to make a statement with the Prime Minister of Luxembourg. Um, but instead of moving that, uh, that statement indoors, somewhere quieter, um, the press conference went ahead. And then, of course, you had the Prime Minister of Luxembourg uh, gesticulating towards an empty lectern. Now, it looks bad, guys, it does. But it has to be said, um, those images w are actually going to be playing down quite well in Boris Johnson's favor because, of course, he is arguing that, you know, big bad Europe is ganging up and bullying Britain. And this is why we need to stand up and leave the EU. So, you know, depending on which side uh, of the argument you are, it's not necessarily a bad image for Boris Johnson. It kind of feeds into his narrative. I'd say he was pretty happy uh, with how yesterday went, actually. Julia, my friend, thank you so much. All right, so let's check our notifications now, starting with a lawmaker who wants to do something about a problem with pigeons pooping in a parking lot. So he goes out there for an interview and then splat Ooh. right there during the interview. He's with like, a local station, yep, a bird targeted him <laughs> saying, oh, you want to do something about me? How about you take this? <laughs> oh. All right, so we have a new world record for an American swimmer, Sarah Thomas, who just finished her swim across the English Channel. She's the first person, man or woman, to make that swim four times nonstop. She finished her treatment for breast cancer just one year ago and dedicated this swim to all the breast cancer survivors out there. 
She says she's not at a 100% just yet, but to me, she looks like she's at 1,000%. I think so. Uh, I'm pretty sure she saw some fish out there, but she didn't see a fish like this one. Take a look. <laughs> that is a ratfish found off the coast of Norway. A man was um, fishing for halibut, blue halibut, and instead he got this sucker there. Um, apparently they're obviously rare, but kind of go back a lot of years. Yeah, it looks um, pretty historic. And, and the fact that he was able to catch this, some skills there. He said it was tasty. Uh, ratfish, that name is very yeah. endearing. It's amazing the fish didn't see his hook coming. Let's just move on to a cuter animal. A bulldog announced her pregnancy in style with a professional maternity shoot. That's right, we're pregnant, look. The mom-to-be mom is posing and uh, with a book that says what to do when you're expecting. Oh, look at her there. I bet those pups are going to be so cute. They are. Hey, and finally, a Simpsons fan tribute video that's worthy of Homer Simpson himself. That's right. Two Swiss tourists who just happen to be professional graphic designers have recreated Homer's notorious food tour of New Orleans frame by frame and snarf by snarf. You see it there. Mmm, donuts. It took the two women an entire week and $500 in food to duplicate the segment, which covers 54 restaurants in one minute and 27 seconds. The side-by-side -side video has racked up more than 1 million views since it was uploaded barely a month ago. Now I want them to write a blog post about the best restaurants in New Orleans and rank them. Oh. Mm. Well, we turn now to Saturday Night Live, firing a new cast member before he even made his debut on the show. Yeah, Shane Gillis has been fired after video surface of him making racist jokes. His firing has reignited the debate over what's comedy and what's offensive. This morning, SNL's new cast member has been fired before the new season even starts. The show is dropping Shane Gillis after a controversial video of the stand-up comic surfaced days after he was hired. It took skull out of my mouth to come up here. <laughs> and I didn't vote for Donald Trump. Makes me like the Nelson Mandela of central Pennsylvania. A 2018 episode of Matt and Shane's secret podcast shows Gillis mimicking a Chinese accent and using a racist slur to refer to Asian people, including a joke about presidential candidate Andrew Yang. He's also under fire for homophobic slurs on his podcast. Gillis issued a statement saying, quote, I am a comedian who pushes boundaries. Sometimes I miss. I'm happy to apologize to anyone who's actually offended by anything I said. I am trying to be the best comedian I can be, and sometimes that requires risk. But his words did little to slow down the outrage. Pablo S. Torre of the ESPN program High Noon tweeted, Settle down, George Carlin. It was only a risk because you and your hack friend are dumb enough to record it. But Yang says Gillis should not lose his job. And overnight, he said the two are planning to meet. Other comics are also coming to Gillis's defense, including former SNL cast member Rob Snyder and comedian Jim Norton. It is my fault that you're all here. This curse... It's inside you all. Who referenced the current blockbuster It Chapter 2, writing, jokes that upset you are not suddenly classified as serious statements just because they upset you. Why is a culture that lines up to watch a clown murder children so polarized over humor? In a statement, NBC said it was not aware of Shane Gillis's prior remarks. SNL's new hires this season also include Bowen Yang, who will become the first regular cast member of the show who's Chinese-American. So that is our question of the day. Should Gillis have been fired? Tell us what you think in the comments or tweet us at ABC News Live. I'm pretty sure a lot of people have a lot of thoughts about this and opinions on this one about what's comedy, what's offensive. That's definitely something that comes up time and time again in yeah. this day and age. Well, coming up, we'll have a look at everything going on in the day ahead. Plus, a little spice mm. for your life on this Tuesday. Stick around. Here's what to watch out for today. President Trump is traveling out west, heading from Albuquerque, New Mexico, to a roundtable with supporters and fundraising luncheon in Palo Alto, California, then another roundtable and fundraiser in Beverly Hills. Meanwhile, on Capitol Hill, three former Trump advisors are due to testify to the House Judiciary Committee in a hearing on presidential obstruction of justice and abuse of power. The committee has said Rob Porter, Corey Lewandowski, and Rick Dearborn were involved in President Trump's extensive efforts to obstruct the Mueller investigation. However, a number of former Trump administration officials have defied subpoenas in recent months. Democrats running for president are on the campaign trail. 
Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, Amy Klobuchar, Andrew Yang, and others will attend the Philadelphia AFL-CIO Workers Presidential Summit. Pete Buttigieg will hold events in South Carolina and Kentucky. And Beto O'Rourke will visit Skid Row and participate in an Equity and Justice Roundtable in Los Angeles. The United Nations General Assembly opens today, and Iranian President Hassan Rouhani is among those expected to attend. The White House has said President Trump may meet with Rouhani on the sidelines, but Iran has dismissed the possibility of a meeting. The Ayatollah saying there will be no talks with the U.S. at any level. Voters are headed to the polls in Israel, where repeat elections are taking place after Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's political coalition collapsed. Netanyahu faces retired military chief Benny Gantz, of the centrist blue and white party. And China is set to unveil the mascots for the 2022 Winter Olympics, which will be held in Beijing. Plus, don't forget to tune in to The Debrief for an update on all our top stories and The Briefing Room for a breakdown of the latest headlines in politics. Finally, on this Tuesday, we leave you with a look at the season premiere of Dancing with the Stars and a little spice for your life. Well, he's one of the most controversial figures and celebrities on Dancing with the Stars, but he made that debut last night, and I think even the critics are enjoying those uh, uh, that uh, lime green blouse there <laughs> by former White House Press Secretary Sean Spicer. Dancing with the Spice Girl, spice up your life. He did get uh, mostly fours, though, across the board. Yeah, he got fours across the board. Uh, it was a big night for Dancing with the Stars. A lot of celebrities showing off their moves. Uh, big night for... Christy Brinkley's daughter, who stepped in for her after she broke her arm, had an injury there. Mm -hmm. um, and very so, early on. Very early on. The scores were mostly low, mm -hmm. um, but it's the you first know, week. You know who got really low scores? I think threes across the board mm -hmm. was Lamar Odom. They said that he wasn't, what was the term they used? Um, good just, at dancing? <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to uh, be nicer there yeah. but basically he lacked finesse is what yeah. they were saying he's a tall but man he's also like seven six how agile do you think he'll be right so <laughs> all right folks well that's it for us on this tuesday morning have a great day and we will see you tomorrow spice up your life